Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I have, um, I'm so honored to uh, have my guest today with Jimmy Thackeray. He's just, uh, he's a great, look, if you don't know Jimmy Thackeray, I'm really glad you're going to meet him and, and get to get, tune on to his music. He's a, and one of the greatest living blues artists. I mean, he's just doesn't hit any wrong notes and he has this inherent <laughs> fee. You don't, man. I've like gone through your whole catalog, like, in preface almost the whole cat and i'm like i prefer <laughs> the bad notes <laughs> uh anyway let me get started um jimmy thackeray born in pittsburgh raised in dc he co-founded the nighthawks in 1972 and went on to record over 20 albums with them in 86 he began touring with the assassins a six piece six piece original blues rock and r&b ensemble which he helped start as a vacation band when the Nighthawks took one of their rare breaks. After the Assassins, Jimmy started a trio called Jimmy Thackeray and the Drivers. And man, I've been listening to their catalog for the last week and a half. And it is as, it is as good and raw and emotional as blues gets. Their last record called Spare Keys came out in 2016. It's wonderful. It is very hard to find an accurate discography on Jimmy and all the projects he's been involved with, but I think it's safe to say, if I say you've released close to 40 records, is that reasonable? <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. Okay, that's what I said. What is the, what is the number, you think? I, don't, I really don't know. Um, I've been making recordings since 1975. And between the three bands and all of the extraneous projects, I got more records out than John Lee Hooker. There you go. So, like, a lot. There's a lot of music out there. Um, I actually was, uh, was uh, told to by a manager uh, that will remain nameless to put together a discography of my stuff. And I sat down and I started to try to count these things up. And I lost count somewhere in the neighborhood of 56. Wow. So I, I, after that, I don't know. And, you know, the thing is, you would, I would go over to Europe, to Belgium, which is probably the, the world's greatest record collector mecca on the planet. And those people would show up with literally coolers full of my product that I did not even know existed. Wow. Autographs on all of, you know, things like that. So I, I really, I'm, I'm not sure what that number is. That's awesome, man. Uh, if you're just getting uh, tur turned on to Jimmy and you're a blues fan, you are in for a real treat. He's just going to light up your sky. Uh, again, like I said, he's one of the greatest living blues guitarists, doesn't play wrong notes, incredibly tasty. He's very economical, but let me tell you right now, he could shred with the best of them when he needs to, when he wants to, but he really knows how to move you and say a lot with his guitar without necessarily saying a lot of words in his notes. Um, man, thank you so much for your time. I'm so, uh, I'm really happy you're here, man. Thank you. I have nothing but time. <laughs> So does everybody else. I know. <laughs> I sent someone a note this morning. I said, hey, if you have some time. And I said, let me not say it like that because I don't want to. Um, all right. So go way back. How did you first? Can do you. With, say that again. Do the time or the time can do you. Yeah, man. Go back. Tell me how you first got started in the music business and what was your first sort of break? break well let's see i had a i had well you know the the little party bands and things like that in seventh grade where i don't really count them as professional although i didn't make a, a ten dollars or something off of that threat. but i started a real blues band around 1969 to 70 with a, a, a literally a savant on harmonica the guy is, to this day, probably one of the best in the world. And at 16 and 17 years old, you know, we were, we were doing real Chicago blues, and no one else was. The only other people that were was probably Paul Butterfield and Corky Siegel, you know. Um, anyway, 
did that for a little while. I got summarily fired for a different guitar player. You're kidding me. Uh, well, I sucked. You know, I sucked. This guy was actually good. And we ended up in the same band together later, so it was okay. But, and, it, you know, I always tell the guys that, that let me go, I say, look, if you hadn't have done that, I would have never started the Nighthawks, which became, you know, a really well-known worldwide group. Yes. Works out for the best. Anyway, I guess the break, I think I'd have to put it at um, playing in a little club called the Cellar Door in Washington, D.C. We got a gig, or actually we, we entered a sort of battle of the bands kind of thing. And the um, big prize was you got to pick who you wanted to open for. Um, and now this was a very, uh, this place had Tom Rush and um, Muddy Waters and, uh, you know, who, who were the acts at the time? Uh, Starland Vocal Band and, you know, all these, a uh, wide range of, you know, pretty top dollar stuff. Very small, very intimate club, incredible acoustics. Well, Muddy Waters, of course, won our um, desire to be the opening act. I mean, we, there's nobody better. Sure. And played in front of Muddy Waters, who absolutely adored us. He, he just thought we were a, a riot. These little white guys, you know, that were just, you know, one guy looked like this sort of uh, biker used car salesman or something, and then the rest of them were these little young hippies, you know. And um, they just thought we were terrific. And from that point, on anytime we we did so well and muddy liked us so much that anytime he came back to that place we got the shot and then we would get called to open for jimmy cotton or um uh james cotton was one there was a couple of other ones oh we got, we actually opened up for linda ronstadt on her first oh wow tour, you know after she had left the stone ponies and was out for her first record. And she had guys that, from the Eagles there. Yeah. And Spooner Oldham on the piano. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know who he was, except that he and I did a lot of drinking together that week. So <laughs> got to know each other. Uh, anyway, um, I would say that was probably the, the, the first really big break that we got. And um, I always said we were, you talk about being in the right place at the right time. Looks. Uh, it just so happened that our situation was such that uh, we were in a unique position to uh, end up playing with or backing up all of the Chicago blues greats. And we got ourselves into a position in a harmonica player from that band got us in a very good position in a big club in D.C. And every month we would bring one of these guys from Chicago, like Otis Rush or uh, Big Walter Horton or J.B. Hutto or Fenton Robinson, um, Jimmy Rogers, Louis Myers, all of these guys uh, we would bring to Washington unrehearsed put them up on the bandstand and just play behind them. Okay, very cool. But of course, turn all these DC people onto these the, the second generation blues, great. So it was very unique. And of course, from that point, it gets around in the music circles. And then pretty soon, you got Bonnie Raitt showing up at your gig. And then you got, you know, Johnny Winter showing up. And then you got, uh, John Belushi showing up at your door, auditioning for bands for his little movie that he's in. And um, hey, yeah, I mean, I'd say that was kind of the trajectory we were on. And um, we got we got to meet all these guys and play with them. You know, I mean, and you know, we we got to uh, 
we were instrumental in bringing a lot of people from uh, Texas and from New England down to the DC area, and thereby sort of creating this touring um, circuit, as it were. We call it the Austin to Boston. Yeah. And one of the first bands we brought up to DC was the Thunderbirds. And from them, we got to meet a little guy named Stevie Ray Vaughan, and we put him on tour with us up in the area. The two worst weeks of my life. <laughs> that guy every night what a sweet guy was and he's just an angel um anyway we you know then we began to bring billy price and his band from pittsburgh down to washington and do gigs with them and you know little by little all of these luminaries would hear about what a good band there was in dc that could back you up with no rehearsal and you could do a gig and blah, blah, blah. And so it was really pretty cool, you know. Did you ever get Freddie King to come? Freddie King was actually, we never did that, but the first concert that we played, we opened for Freddie King and Paul Butterfield and Better Days. Oh my that, God. That night. You met your first wife that night? Yeah. Wow, that's wild. Holy crap, what a show. You guys, Paul Butterfield and Freddie King. God, that's almost hard. That's almost impossible to believe that you get a lineup like that. What's that? Constitution Hall. Wow. In Washington. Yeah. The big time, man. Yeah. Uh, amazing. What were the biggest challenges? for the Nighthawks early on in, you know, in that 70s period when you were first starting up? Trying to compete against top 40. Um, I once was able to sit down with Jay God. Oh, wow. a, and this was years later, many years later, and say, you're not going to understand this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because you guys were the reason that I did not have to ever put on a leisure suit and play in a holiday inn. <laughs> because of their breakthrough. Well, because they had had hits and we learned the first Jay Giles album, basically note for note. Okay. We were suddenly allowed to come into these nightclubs that would normally never come anywhere near us. And so, um, and that was the biggest thing, was trying to break through um, sort of the thick-headed top 40 mentality of uh, club owners and audiences. In 1973 and 74, um, blues was, what's blues? We don't know what blues yeah. is. Um, they were, the, the basic generic audience in, in America, I was listening to something entirely different. The first time we went to Florida, there were all the big hair bands, you know, the the uh, platform shoes and big hair, Marshalls and all that kind of stuff. And we had to open for all these guys. Two years later, we came back and they were all opening for us. Wow. So what? So what was, in your opinion, as an observer, you're pretty astute with things like this what was the turning like wh what granted acceptance what people you know if you could get up there and play the entire jay giles live album that went over to a certain extent i mean the energy of that alone was enough to you know do that and we did a lot of elvis presley stuff and we did a lot of rockabilly and a lot of soul music. We did very little blues in the early days. We did some, but we were not a blues band. We were a rock and roll, American music rock and roll band. We just happened to have a harmonica player. Well, you know, <clears throat> to this day, I'm a blues guitarist, which I'm really, I'm really not. I, 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 I'm, I like what Tinsley says. Tinsley Ellis says, I'm really a rock guitar player that plays some blues. And I'd have to go along with that for myself. I'd have to say that that's 
kind of, yeah. Um, I can play it well, but. Uh, yeah, re really well, man. Through Grove Alarm, you know. Uh, but my God. Um, anyway, the, the, the challenge was, of course, to uh, go out to uh, rural areas of Maryland and Virginia where, you know, the, the, um, the clientele of these places was still uh, quite a few years behind. And, you know, you start playing the stuff. Back in those days, if they didn't know the words to the songs you were playing, you sucked. Wow. And it was that simple. I once got a note up on the stage that said, we can't dance to this because we don't know the words. Holy crap. Well, I mean, that was like, okay, I get it now. I'm getting the... Yeah, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. So you had to respond to that by playing stuff they knew? Well, it helped. Mm -hmm. um, throw in Little Sister or Hound Dog or, you know, or Wham or Jammer or something like that. Of course, the stuff that had been on jukeboxes, even in the crappiest of the, of the uh, Lounge Lizard um, Temples of Doom, um, you know, you could get over. Yeah. Said to Jay, uh, you guys, because of you guys, we didn't have to. We didn't have to cross over that line and play the stuff that we just hated. Yeah. And you know, I've heard somebody else mention that Jay Giles album and what a breakthrough it was in a similar vein. So I'm not surprised to hear this, man. Well, nobody wanted to hear a rock and roll band with a harmonica player in it. That was what's that? See playing up the guy looks like he's eating a sandwich, you know. Uh, um, the the Nighthawks were obviously a very important and a big part of your life. What would would you say were the two biggest, two or three biggest, either experiences or takeaways that you got from that whole time frame? Well. Um, gosh, that's a, you know, there's, there is so much that happened. It was only, uh, <clears throat> it was really about 17 years um, that I was with that band. And that doesn't seem like, you know, that, that doesn't seem like an inordinately long period of time, but a lot happens when you're 18, 19 years old, and then you add on 17 years, I, you know, a lot happens. And, um, you know, um, one of the things was ha actually having Greg Allman join our band for a short period of time. Uh, things went completely crazy and chaotic. And it was also very exciting, but it was, also something that made me realize that superstardom, though I was probably never gonna get there, was also probably something that was not necessarily something you should aspire to. Um, it's not real pretty. In, in what way? Uh, the people that you attract, the attention you attract, the lack of privacy, the intensity of your of your life, um, your time is not your own. Um, everyone is telling you what to do, and everyone wants something from you yeah. all the time. Um, we got that in smaller enough doses to know that that was something that was. Uh, I mean, if you guys want to go that way, you can go that way, and I, and I wish you luck but I kind of saw what it did to that guy and realized pretty early it's probably one some I wanted to be. Yeah. What else was a memorable experience or lesson from there, that? I mean, my gosh, I mean, uh, um, all those shows with Muddy were just um, earth shattering, you know, uh, Playing behind Otis Rush was. Uh, <laughs> that had to be pretty cool. Faster, 
for the closest thing to heaven you ever attain. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I got to see Stevie come and go. I saw the rise of George Thorogood. You know, George slept at my house a lot um, in his early days when he'd come down from Delaware to try to play in Washington. Um, I ran a rock and roll hotel. Everybody in the world stayed in my little house. And uh, T tell me a funny, tell me, you've got to have hundreds of stories without getting anybody in trouble. Tell me a funny one. Well, uh, the best one that I <laughs> was Johnny Winter was up looking for a new band. And he was trying to find a band that could play rock and roll and blues, uh, both. And uh, he had come up to DC because the T-Birds were going to play a double bill with us in our little local tavern. And um, the easiest thing was to just uh, put him up at the Rock and Roll Hotel. Well, uh, it was supposed to be kind of a secret audition sort of thing, but of course it leaked out immediately. So by the time this show came down, the, I mean, it was a, a near riot spilled out onto the streets and it was chaotic. It was, you know, it was insane. And my ex-wife was a barmaid there and I'll never forget it. She said, I know I served that guy 24 bottles of blue nut myself. <laughs> Wait a minute, served Johnny? Holy smokes. Well, and he was, it was the days of the quail food. 20, wow, that's almost impossible to believe. 24 bottles. I was absolutely bionic, he really was. And so we have no idea how much of all of this the guy consumed. <clears throat> all I knew was that a, a large party ended up at my house after the year. That was pretty out of control. Johnny never appeared for that. Uh, in the meantime, his girlfriend that he had brought down with him to drive the car because he's legally, he was legally blind, um, had gotten completely wrecked on the quaaludes and gone up and passed out in the guest room. Well, I finally got everybody out of there and the wife and I crashed. And around 8.30 in the morning, um, I hear this, the doorbell, and I'm like, oh my God, what now? So I go down, open the door, hey, rocker. <laughs> a bottle of blue nut in his hand, just drunk as a monkey. And, you know, I let him in. He goes up the stairs, and I go back to bed, and in about 15 minutes, I can tell that he is literally beating the living daylights out of this woman. Oh my God. Well, what do you do? Do I call the cops? There's a rock star in my house and he's beating his girlfriend. No. Or do I go and try to break it up? Or do I wait and see if it mends itself? Number three is what actually happened. He got this woman up and convinced her to get in that Thunderbird and drive his drunk ass back to New York. Wow. And of course, she shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been walking, much less driving a large automobile. Johnny apologized for that for the rest of his life every time I saw him. Oh, wow. But it was just one of those things where you just, you just can't believe it's you can't believe it's happening at the time. You know, yeah. um, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Holy shit! That was just an, an average Saturday, huh? Yeah, it was, yeah. We called oh. that. Um, you know, there there was just all kinds of stuff, man. I mean, at one point, I remember, and this is my favorite story, mostly because I wasn't there for it. The, the old lady and I had gone to our usual place in the Virgin Islands uh, for vacation. But J.B. Hutto, who had been a dear friend for a long time, he was actually the first blues guy I actually ever shared a stage with and played with. We've been friends for a long time. 
and he had come down uh, with his new band, Ted Harvey and Brewer Phillips. Now, these were the guys that backed up Hound Dog Taylor. These guys were old Duck's nephews. I mean, they were, they were off. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know. <laughs> Donald Duck's <laughs> nephews. Or <laughs> they're trying to find the liquor store because they want to make vodka omelets. You know, I mean, these guys. <laughs> okay, so they come down and stay at my house. Well, I said, there's only one way I'll let this happen because I, I knew what was getting ready. JB was, was sober and sweet. He had diabetes, so he couldn't drink. And so he thought this was going to be a big deal. And, you know, everybody knew Hound Dog's band. Hound Dog had been dead for some time. And so this is going to be his new band. And he was all excited. And he was going to stay at my house with these knuckleheads. And they were going to broadcast the thing on the radio station, which was across the street from the little neighborhood tavern that I told you about. And um, George Thorogood was going to keep an eye on it. He was going to stay at my house and watch him make sure nothing got too crazy. Well, of course, it began to get crazy pretty much immediately. Wow. Yes, the show was just just horrifying. It was so out of tune and so terrible. And guys had been drinking the whole day. And JB was just very, very embarrassed. And he didn't know what to do. And of course, George went, I got to go. Bye. And uh, left those guys with my sound guy um, who tried to keep order. Anyway, the fight went on after the show into the wee hours. The, and this was just standard operating procedure for these two guys. They fought all the time, but a hound dog could slap them around. And, you know, they were afraid of him. And they, he'd put him back in, in the box, you know. Anyway, these guys had gone completely off the chain. Now they were out in the front yard, still in their stage clothes, you know, wearing fezzes and lime green suits and whatever. And one of them's got a gun. Oh, <laughs> nice. Just what you and need with alcohol. <laughs> Go ahead, back to Chicago, motherfucker. I'll shoot your ass. Boom, boom. Well, that would be bad enough. But it's now 7 o'clock in the morning, or 7.30 in the morning. Across the street, Cata Corner, is an elementary school. Oh. Little kids are all walking to school with their little, you know, uh, Jetson's lunchbox and Flintstone's mm -hmm. backpacks. And my landlady lives across the street. Oh, yeah, that's not good. So... I get back from my vacation <laughs> and I kind of get word that things were a little weird. I finally get a call from the landlady. She said, um, did you have some folks staying with you? <laughs> I said, lady, I don't know anything about that. That's my friend George Thorogood invited him. I don't know who they were. He was house sitting. I'm very, very sorry. It'll never happen again. Okay, that's fine. No. Oh you. my, yeah. That would have been it. Anyway, everybody went their separate ways and everything was fine. Nobody got hurt. But it's just like, yeah, if I told this story, no one would believe me, you know. And as I said, I didn't even, I didn't even witness it. This was going on while I was out of town. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Although it's better probably in a sense that you didn't have to deal with it. Holy crap. There, um, there's, or there, there, you know, people are always saying, well, you should write the book. You should sit down and write the book. And I say, you know, a lot of people are going to have to die before I do that. <laughs> it changed the names. <laughs> it's going to have no. Yeah, it's going to have no, no impact. No impact and no appeal. So I keep my little stories to myself. I tell a couple like that just to give you an idea. Yeah. Um, only if you're comfortable answering and I'm not looking for any gossip, what prompted you to leave the Nighthawks? It, it's very simple. Um, I had 
we had been doing these sort of vacation bands. We would do, we were doing about 300 nights a year, close to it. Oh. Well, like I said, those were the hay, man. You, know. you, were, you were playing 300 nights a year, which means you were never home. No. Oh. And so you know, at least one of those, we'd take two vacations a year, usually in January and one in August. The one in August, I would go to my place in the Virgin Islands. Uh, in January, I started doing this. Uh, actually, Catfish Hodge came up with this idea of putting together a, an all-star band for a week and just play some great music, have some wonderful times. Everybody gets a chance to sing. Everybody solos and everybody's the leader of a band or a, a luminary in one of the local bands. There was so much going on in D.C. back then. It was, crazy. It was really nuts. DC was a musical mecca that no one knows about. There was so much great talent there. And if you go back and you look at it, you see all the people that came out of, you know, learned in DC, came out of DC, went on to become bigger stars and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of mind blowing, you know. But anyway, uh, we were doing that kind of thing. And I had gotten together with this. Uh, we had put a, a different band together and it really just rocked my world. And I began to realize, you know, in one week, I was able to put all of this great material that wasn't just one, four, five kind of blues stuff or real simple because of the limitations of the harmonica. The, the, the harmonica is a limiting instrument to a, yeah. to a degree. Um, and because of that, you have to stay within a certain framework. Um, and I began to realize with a really good keyboard player and another great guitar player, and an amazing bass player, and a, an amazing drummer. And, you know, wow, you could go anywhere. You could just do all this stuff. Well, at 300 nights a year, we found ourselves, the, the last thing we wanted to do was sit around with each other um, write songs and come up with new material because they you know because well I hate the way you eat you know yeah you're sick of each other from so much what's that familiarity breeds contempt to some extent so you know I began to think oh boy you know I can't wait for January and uh, I did this for a couple of years and it became um, the, the harmonica player, in my estimation, became a bit of a tyrant. And I became a snot-nosed um, uh, resistor. And so those things began to become, you know, polarizing. And of course, when you do that kind of thing, you try to get the other guys on your side. Yeah, it's like going through a divorce almost. It is. And so pretty soon you begin to realize, okay, I, I see where this is going. And okay, I'm now well into my 30s and I'm starting late 30s. And I'm starting to think, you know, if I'm going to make a leap to do something on my own, I better start thinking about it. And so I thought about it and I thought about it. And I, and I really, I mean, I really. I angsted over it because my whole life had been touring with these same four guys for yeah. the longest been all over the world with this outfit. And um, you know, it, it is like a divorce. It's like suddenly your life is going to come to a screeching halt and everything is going to change. Am I ready for that? Well, at some point you just go, you know, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? So I gave my notice. And um, the biggest mistake I made was trying to actually put that vacation band together as a permanent thing, which caused nothing but trouble. And um, the band grew from five pieces to almost 13 from time to time. Wow, that's a hell of a management job, man. And you talk about herding cats. Yeah. You know, the great sound. You know, but what I began to realize was that because of all of that going on, 
um, while I was using my name and marquee value to market this band, I was playing, you know, maybe four or five solos a night. Well, my fans weren't interested in that. Yeah. Going balls to the wall all the time like they used to. Hmm. And so that band began to just, it began to kind of contract. And uh, it wasn't really going anywhere. And then the money just dried up. And once I saw that the money had dried up, I said, okay, now i got to make a real business decision. So I said, I'm going to, take out everybody except the rhythm section. I'm going to go back to trying something completely new, which is being the only front man and just do a trio. Well, I did that. And then to my horror, I began to realize I, I was going to go just play blues. You know, I was just going to go back to the roots and just play blues. I come to the horrifying realization that the rhythm section could not play blues. What? What? They just uh, wasn't their thing, or not their thing? They were coming from R and B, funk, and jazz, and pop. These two players, they were not schooled in it. They could play a blues progression. Anybody can. Yeah. But you know, there are nuances. There are different styles. There are. Uh, different lopes to the shuffles. There's there's a lot of mechanics involved in doing it right. These guys knew none of it. And I realized, well, I don't have the time to teach. I would go back and teach them all the stuff. And besides that, they're not interested. Yeah, which is the big problem, yeah. They wanted a paycheck. And so I said, okay, well, this ain't going to work. So um, one by one, I fired those guys, and I got a pretty decent um, little trio together. And it stayed together for about nine years, I guess. And um, then I went into the, then it got into the personnel changes. And then, you know, change this personnel, and then, and then this guy goes, and then, then you're in this constant revolving door of new guys coming in, and pretty soon you're back to square one. You don't have the time to actually sit down and do all this new material because every time you, you turn around, you're trying to work in a new guy on a short set of material from the last roundup. Yeah. So you're chasing your tail again. So here I am, I'm back chasing my tail again. I'm going, okay, well, uh, um, in the meantime, up to a certain point, it was still fun. And as my old original bass player from the trio used to say, uh, yeah, this seeing the world through a bug spattered windshield is just great. He'd say, uh, 22 hours of hell for two hours of fun. <laughs> and that's what a lot of musicians say. Sardonic guy, rest yeah. in peace. Anyway, um, you know, at some point you begin to realize, like I said, okay, I used to be able to put all this crap behind me that were over here and not pay any attention to it. But now it's really looming. You know, it's, it's up here in my face. Um, uh, walking through an airport ain't as easy as it used to be. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up to the task like I was. And then somewhere in the process of all this, I moved out of the country. And so the difficulties that that brings up are not many, but there are some. And, yeah, sure. uh, you know. I, I give you credit for sticking that out because it would have been real easy to let self, you know, when the first project and then the sec, when these things don't work after you had a good thing that work, it would have been really easy to let that self doubt creep into your head and make you second guess and, you know, that you kept going. You get in front of those people in that bar and they scream. And mm. that does it. That is the most addicting substance on earth. That mm. is what all of us live for. That interaction, that adoration, that cheerleading, whatever they want to call it. 
you can you will call yourself an applause junkie or whatever you want to do. But there's something about once you've gotten there, once you see a packed room full of cute girls and handsome young guys, and they're all juking around and having a ball, and after every time you play a solo, they all go, Wee! you know, there's nothing like that. Yeah. So as long as that was going on, I could put up with almost anything. Wow. What? Um... And I did. Wow. <laughs> Because all of these guys have issues. All of these guys have personal problems. You know, they all have a substance abuse thing, or they've got, you know, a home life that's a wreck, or they're, they're sociopath. Or... <laughs> that's a rough one. <laughs> it's tough. And um, you have to, you know, somehow you have to mitigate all those things in order to be the band leader and say, come on guys, let's have fun, you know? And sometimes you can do that. And sometimes you kind of go, eh, come on, get in the truck. <laughs> Did you manage to stay away from drugs and substance abuse? Oh. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. It was part of all of it back in the, I mean, like I said, the great part about it was the ability to see, play with, and meet all of your heroes. Yeah. But during the time, the thing that reared its ugly head was alcohol and drugs. And, and listen, when you're first starting out, um, you're not getting paid shit. Yeah. So uh, if you're getting free draft beer and uh, uh, cheap tequila, as part of your pay, shit, you're going to drink a bunch of it. Yeah. So we take speed and then drink as much free beer and tequila as we could. You know, um, the speed was to keep us from passing out. Sure. And this is how you. This is how you learn. Did that get ever ever get out of hand for you? Or you always managed to contain that. It did. What? How? Like, how did you like? Uh, did you get sober or did you, would like, how did you? I would do so sober periods. I did several of them. And um, they would work, you know, for a, a while. You know, I've had a couple of periods of work for a good long while. Um, but the, the thing that got me was finally my present wife sitting me down. And the both of us were heavy drinkers. Uh, the, the drugs had gone by the wayside. That, that was not an issue anymore. Um, but the drinking was getting really bad. And uh, I had another guy in the band that was really bad too. So, of course, we were working off each other. And uh, at the age of 50, she basically just sat me down and just said, we need to stop this. And um, she made enough sense, and I loved her so much that I decided she was right, and uh, this time I was going to make it work. So I credit her, really. And then once you <laughs> once you've had it behind you long enough, and look at it in the rear view mirror, it's ugly. Yeah. And you don't, you know, it's not it's not even something that I'm tempted to even think about sure. anymore. Man, I uh, it's so good that she ha it. I know what it's like to have a relationship like that, and and I'm I feel lucky, and I'm happy to hear that. Look, you're a very lucky guy. If you have someone in your life like that, hold on to it because oh, uh, 20, 20, 27 years life, and that's yeah. the best you'll ever be in your life. Yes. And, I, and I'm aware of that. And I know, and I was just telling her that the other day, you know, and uh, I'm so happy that you, she came to you and that you guys did that together. That's really nice. Well, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the, yeah, but you know, that's not usually the, the, you know, addict that wants to use, they're going to use money is not the first thing they're thinking of, you know, I can't afford it. They get it somehow, you know that. And so, um, yeah, yeah. 
That's cool, man. That's a really nice story. I'm glad. Well, and if you, like I said, if you're brought up in bars, I mean, it's free for the most yeah. part. It's there, and it's just so tempting. And you got it's always to me. It's always the little angel guy on this shoulder and the little devil guy on this shoulder. And you know, don't do it, Jim. It's bad for you, and it makes you act like a, an animal. And this guy, <laughs> go ahead. One's not gonna kill you. Look at those tits. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, that thing going on the yin yang you know you have this this um sort of dichotomy going on all the time in your life and um you got to start listening to this side and not that side yeah does, some, that, does that little guy ever show up anymore he doesn't show up anymore good for right? you man that's fucking huge good for you well you know it's it's just uh being down here, this is this has been good for my soul. Uh, I live on a little farm. Uh, we grow lots of fruit trees and, and raise chickens. A chicken rancher. I know, and, and you sent me that email. I, you said I got to get the chickens this morning. <laughs> That's not an email I'm getting normally. Worker is I've had to furlough him because of the lockdown. We're even our even our little district is in a lockdown. He can't even cross the bridge from his district over in mine. So now I got to do all his chores. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize, um, I mean, I kind of did, but uh, doing it every day, man, it's, it's tough work. I'm, I should pay this guy more money. Well, hopefully he don't hear this podcast. No, he won't. <laughs> but, you know, uh, chickens shit a lot. They shit a lot. And when it's time to clean out their little house, it's nasty, you know. But at the same time, I'm eating fresh eggs every morning, and I like that. Yeah, yeah. What made you move to Belize? Like, how did that decision make? What was the decision making process? This always comes up. And if I if I really explain the real reason, uh, you run the risk of turning off half of the people or more. Uh, just be yourself don't worry about turning anybody off man just be yourself whatever you want to a lot of it was um i didn't like the way I, the, I, it, as long as 20 years ago i began to see the u.s on a trajectory that was not sustainable and um uh, i i began to become conscious of forces in the world that uh, were tearing that country apart. Basically, I began to come to the conclusion that America was basically being sold off like a stolen Cadillac. <laughs> you know? um, and I saw some really nasty writing on the wall a fairly long time ago. And uh, at some point, it all kind of came to a head but the wife said, look, you know, we don't have kids. I'm sorry, you don't have what? Okay. No. Um, we have very little family left. But most everybody's died off. She's got a brother and I've got a brother. Um, we're kind of diametrically opposed politically and all that. So. It, we're, we're at a distance to a degree. And it basically came down to, uh, at some point, uh, her, one of her relatives passed away and she came into a little money. And we began to realize that at the current burn rate of our money, now I, was, I, I mean, I was living in Arkansas, you know, so cheap place to live. Yeah. So, it was coming up the driveway, man. It was coming through the mailbox. It was coming through the phone. It was coming through the TV. The gizmocracy, the technocracy was, was taking over. And it was becoming more and more obtrusive. And basically, we just kind of said, you know, we could um, take the money that we do have, cash everything out, pay off everything, 
take a leap of faith and go find some place. Um, you know, let's see what's out there. And when we found this place, we began to realize, you know, it's two hours from the U.S. by air. So it's commutable. I can still work. I can fly up, meet the guys, do a tour, fly home. So I can sustain my, my work. Yeah. And that, that was important to me. But it was getting away from the, getting away from government, getting away from regulations, getting away from the, the oppression of any number of administrations in the last 20 years. Sure. And we were just, once we found this place, we began to realize that all the signs were pointing us here. Pointing okay. This, not to just this country, to this house. Wow. That's good. So you had like some serendipitous moments that were like. Way beyond that. It okay. Was way, it was, and I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not a touchy feely metaphysical new age cat. Man. No, but when <laughs> shit happens, you got to pay attention to it. You got to read the sign. Yeah. Yeah. It kept happening over and over and over. And, um, when we got here, it was daunting because, of course, it's a completely different world. You yeah. Know? You moved from the, from the mountains to a jungle, and it's like, what was that noise? We don't know. <laughs> Do you, wow, here, that's right. I'm talking to you, and I'm watching a very large black scorpion going across my floor and going over into a corner to hide. Wow. Wow kill this little son of a bitch before he goes someplace and bites one of my dogs. So <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a no, it's a whole different world. So to us, it was like, we can a leap of faith and do this now or wait till we're retirement age and go down someplace in a walker, you know, check into the villages in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny that you called out that community. That is fucking hilarious. Blow our brains out, you know. <laughs> we began to realize that at the current burn rate of, of what we were spending, just in the cheap place of Arkansas, in seven years, we were going to be living under a bridge. Wow, yeah. Because you never get out of it. It's yeah. designed never to get out of it. Correct, yeah. So, uh, we bought this place. You, when you buy real estate here, you, you can finance stuff, but it's eh, not easy. We bought this place cash. We took everything out of the stock market, everything out of the 401ks, everything out of the IRAs. We cashed out everything. We sold everything. Good for you. And it's cash on the barrel head. Paid off all the credit cards. I finally, two years ago, I paid off my van. So we actually owe nothing. Good for you, man. Nothing. Did you have to learn so how to speak Spanish? No. Oh, the official language of Belize is English. Okay. So, okay. So most people speak English. Everybody. Speak okay, English. cool. That's awesome. It's better than others. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. That's really... Um, what was the what were some of the biggest cultural adjustments that you had to make? It, I don't mean cultural, like it could be weather. Uh, obviously, you went from Nebraska to the. It's probably really humid there. I would imagine. I'm sorry, Arkansas. Arkansas, Arkansas to to the jungle in Belize. It's probably humid. It's very humid. It's very hot. Um, actually, I got very used to it. Um, I'm in my little music room right now. Normally, I have a dehumidifier roaring in the corner to keep my guitars from coming apart at the seams. Yeah. That was something I had to get over with pretty quick. I finally had to seal this up and put it in a dehumidifier that drains out the wall to keep my instruments from yeah. free. Um, I had to get used to the weather. Um, but that was not that difficult. And of course, you know, we have. Um, really poisonous snakes. Oh, 
we have um, scorpions, and we have tarantulas, and we have all kinds of creepy crawly stuff. Uh, but you learn to get by with that. Um, you know, it's, it's a totally different culture down here. Uh, it's more of a Caribbean culture. It's a mixture of, there, there, you know, all of that diversity that you guys are being legislated into. You have to like these people and these people and these people and the, the identity politics of, of the U.S. Yeah. Well, that's already going on here, organic. Yeah, we which have, is cool. We have uh, Mestizo, Hispanic. We have Creole. We have Garifuna. We have Chinese, Taiwan. Uh, European, Canadian, American, Mennonite. We have a wow. lot here, which we take advantage of now because, of course, we can go down there and get really great fresh vegetables from them. They're wonderful farmers, lovely people. Um, in other words, all of that is, is going on without anybody forcing it. Everybody kind of get well, nobody likes the Chinese much, but... <laughs> And so, uh, but yeah, there's a cultural difference. I was kind of a little more used to it than she was because I had lived in the Caribbean before. And there's a, a Caribbean influence that you, you have to factor in. A lot of it is the time factor. Um, people don't have a sense of time here like they do up there. Yeah. Um, uh, there's... There's a lot to there's a lot to sort of get used to, but after a while, and it didn't take us very long, but I feel very much at home here, and I feel very much like a fish out of water when I go back to America. Wow, interesting. I never expected, but but it's come to that. What's uh, what's your favorite food that you eat down there that you didn't get to? You know, that's culturally unique to that country. Rice and beans is, of course, the, the, the main thing here, which is why everyone has diabetes. Oh, because of all the... I don't eat a lot of that. Right. <clears throat> they eat fish and chicken and rice and beans. Uh, the vegetable uh, thing is negligible, but the produce here is absolutely delicious, and it's very fresh. And it's full of nutrients, and it's not GMO. And it's um, GMO is actually outlawed here. Wow! Which so, is a big yeah. Big, that's uh, they're trying to. My wife is one of the people trying to get glyphosate banned, uh, which is the ingredient in yeah. Roundup. Everyone. Um, the uh, look, they eat stuff like iguana here. Uh, how, they, how have you tried that? Not tried that, and I'm not gonna. Uh, the things are disgusting enough as it is. <laughs> there is, yeah, there's a little creature that like the, a little jungle rat called a gib nut, G I B N U T, that's a little veg vegetable eating rodent. Uh, about the size of a beaver, and during gib nut season, everyone goes out and hunts those things. And yeah, that, that and they're actually very good. Really, that's wild. Actually, quite good. Um, that's wild. <laughs> you send some home to your friends. <laughs> Package with some uh, freshly packed uh, gib nut steaks, you know, yeah. like Omaha. <laughs> wow. <Very cool. laughs> that's great man holy crap so everything's wor so you're happy it sounds like you're really happy very happy here i mean i'm a little you know right now everyone is scratching their heads all over the world over this thing yeah um, like i say i could I, i've got my own my own thoughts about it, which I won't bother sharing, but um, under normal circumstances, this is a very, um, a, a pretty nice place. People are very polite, respectful. 
the British did a pretty good job here. Yeah. You can say what you want about colonialism and all that kind of stuff, but um, uh, the the country got its independence in '81, and uh, quite frankly, it would have been good if they had stayed part of England for another decade before getting there. They, they would have been a lot further along with their infrastructure and their education system and that kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a poor country. It's not like El Salvador or uh, Honduras or anything like that uh, because we're pegged to the U.S. dollar to one. Okay. rely on tourism, which, of course, there is none of right now. Sure. Uh, but for that reason, it's a little more opulent here than the rest of the uh, uh, Central American countries. So it's a really good fit. And, um, you know, I, I, I get along here very well. I love the people that I, that I know here. And uh, it's an easy place to live. It's an easy you know, Like I said, you got to get used to the heat, which is, it's not so much that it's really, really hot. Uh, it's, it's like Florida. It's got yeah. this it. But, you know, I grew up in D.C., which is one of the worst. Same thing in the summertime. Uh, there's at least one month that you can't go outside the house in Washington. Usually August. Yeah, um, it's brutal. Uh, was 10 times hotter than it is in Belize. The humidity is a little bit lower, but not mm. by much. Do you have an AC there? I have an AC unit in my bedroom, which we use very infrequently. Okay. Electricity is kind of steep. Yeah, I would imagine. Oh, you use it when you just plain have to. Yeah. Uh, but I've gotten used to it. I prefer not having air conditioning. And I found that when I go back to America, everything is air conditioned. Yeah, for sure. My, you know, my nails would start to break and my hair would start to fall out. You know, <laughs> you start to, you know, dry up. And, mm. uh, you know, because of all the insurance and regulations, all the motels are sealed like a tuna sandwich now. Yeah. You know, the window. Um, uh, everything is climate control, climate control, climate control. And um, here, everything is wide open and it, it's never before breathed air. And it's really kind of delightful. That's awesome, man. Well, congratulations on that. It sounds like you found your, uh, found your spot. I'm happy here. And it's, it, it, it really takes the sting out. If, I, if I'm actually admitting to myself that the touring thing is over, if that decision has been made for me and maybe for anyone else, I don't know. We'll have to see. But this place takes some of the sting out of that. Oh, that's and awesome. That, so <clears throat> if we go back to it, then I'm, I'm okay with that. If things go back to where they kind of were, where I had left it with my booking agent was um, if someone calls up and has a good paying date, a festival or a concert or a benefit or something like that, um, let's put a few club dates around it. Right. I'll, we'll throw the knuckleheads in the van. We'll go do that thing for two weeks and then everybody go their separate ways because I really still enjoy, I've never enjoyed the actual playing any more than I do right now. Yeah. Because um, you're always at the top of your game if you're a guitar player. <laughs> you're always playing as good as you're ever going to probably play. Yeah. You know, tomorrow you're going to be even better. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I enjoy the playing as much as ever, if not more so. What I don't enjoy is what I gotta go through to make that happen. Yeah, flights, travel, hotels, all that bullshit, totally. You know, in the hotel, I tell you what, one of the biggest problems that I think is that we're gonna see in America after this is over uh, is the hotel industry. Yeah, I was wondering about that. The hotel industry was, a major ripoff to begin with. Even the high-end places were pieces of shit. When you 
in there and, you know, turned up the mattress and saw the bed bugs at the, at the uh, Hyatt, uh, you know, you begin to go, well, wait a minute, man. And, and the low end stuff, the cheap, the days of staying in cheap, that's over. Forget that. Because I would let my dog stay in one of those places. Yeah. So these places aren't coming back. They're not coming back. They're done. Yeah. Because they're built like shit to begin with. They're built like, you know, a Lego thing anyway. They're just slapdash throw it together, it's the cheapest construction for the money that they can do. Um, they're very seldom up to code, and they're not cleaned. It's all about turnover. And this is the same thing with the airlines. You know, they're not cleaning those airplanes. That's why everybody that gets off them has a cough. Yeah, and then they get, everybody gets on. Everyone's sick, because that air circulates to that HEPA filter at 0.01% humidity, you know, constantly. And that thing lands, three guys get in there, they wipe the back of the seats off, and then throw another bunch of sick people on there and take off. So it's the same with the hotels. It's all turnover. And it's it's not run very well to begin with. So I, I don't see either of those industries. I think all of this, oh, I think I'll fly to Chicago for the weekend, Muffy. I don't think that's going to be something we're going to be doing yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens i hope for the best for everybody of course but yeah the 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 greatest scenario would be that we were back to square one and everything was humming along and everybody was back at their job and you know yeah here we go but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes man it's that's very scary i don't want to get into that but, you know. uh, let me ask you this. You talked about your guitars before having to seal off that room. Uh, what's your go-to guitar that you play today? The one you grab the most and has that changed over the years? Um, All right, here it is. I just put this one together out of parts. It's a Frankenstrat. Oh, wow. And I just, I mean, I had this neck lying around, um, and, and, and I was doing another way. The neck that was on this, I didn't like, and uh, this was set up for a Floyd, because that's that's usually my number one. My '64 Strat is set up with a Floyd Rose, which drives the guitar nerds insane, of course. <laughs> How could you do that? You know. A lot, but a lot of people play with Floyds. Not on a 64 Strat. No, not on a 64 Strat for sure, but a lot of people play with Floyds. Anyway, um, I just decided one day I was just going to switch the next and see if I could make it work. And, uh, you know, in Belize, you have to work with what you got. There's yeah. no loot. There's no supply stores. There's none of that kind of stuff. So um, I slapped this neck on, but the nut, the old Floyd nut piece uh, was too low when I got it put on this body. So I had to get real crafty and I took three razor blades and cut them to fit under this nut. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's pretty engine, a lot of ingenuity there. Man. I got enough clearance on that first fret. Um, the strings actually slide through this thing rather well. I was sort of surprised. I was thinking this metal thing, this is where you normally lock everything down, of course. And I don't have that. I just have this thing sliding through. And I thought, well, surely these wound strings are going to get hung up in there. But you throw a little Vicks vapor rub in, <laughs> and it, it works. Just fine. That's pretty. So is that a Fender body and, a, and a, a Fender neck, but just not from the same guitars? That's right. Very cool. You know, that, I mean, this is a '58 middle pickup. I don't know what these are. I think they're Klein pickups. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, I just had all this crap laying around, and I had nothing to do. So I decided, hey, 
here's a project for the day. Anyway, I really enjoy it. Yeah. I, I like tinkering on stuff. Um, you know, this was the old Nighthawks guitar. Right. Wow. How old? What is? What guitar is that, man? That's a 1971 Medallion V. Number 79. Wow. Um, this, this went everywhere. This went everywhere. I bought this off of the widow of um, Vinnie Taylor, also known as Chris Donald, who was the guitar player for Shanana. Oh, was that's wild. Roommate for the first few years and who OD'd in the, uh, the Holiday Inn in Charlottesville, Virginia. Anyway, I bought this from her, and it became sort of my trademark. Somewhere along the line, I, I eh, it's a long story, but Danny Gatton had, uh, had fixed it. Uh, the bridge had, was falling over, and he took, a, um, he took the old tunematic out, and he put a cocktail piece on as a bridge and for the first time in my entire career i now knew what perfect intonation was wow i did the guy was a genius not just a genius guitar player he was an engineer and a complete spatial genius and he put this thing on there so that all of a sudden it it jived with the harmonica Every key and every every note was perfect on this thing, and it was the most amazing revelation I'd ever had. Plus, this thing sounds like Godzilla. What kind of pickups you got on there? Right now, they're Bardens. Okay, and been Joe Barden. Ever since Joe invented them, uh, this one is a prototype, an original prototype. And this one I replaced with another one of his. It's a split coil. And the resonance that you get on that just acoustically is amazing. And I'm listening to it through Zoom. It sustains. It's still going. That's amazing. Okay, so the story goes, it fell over because the pickup well had a crack. Mm thing fell over and I kept trying to put it back and I couldn't get it back and I couldn't get it in the right spot. And so the intonation thing that I had discovered was now wrong. Everything was wrong. My life was over. <laughs> it was horrible. And I finally had such a love-hate relationship with, with this thing that I, I decided I'm going to get a new guitar and I'm going to turn this into a fucking wall hanging. Wow. That's do is I'm going to do kind of what my buddy George Thorogood had done, which is get some heroes to sign it, and then just hang it over the mantelpiece, the hell with the damn thing. So the first guy happened to be Carl Perkins, <laughs> playing with him in Austin, and at sound check, I said, Carl, do me a favor, would you? You'd scratch your name in this thing, and he said, why, sure, Jim. And he pulled out a butt knife about this long. And he scratched his name in your guitar. Holy crap. Well, yeah. That's amazing. Now, so I went from there, and I got B.B. King. And then I got the Vaughn Brothers. And then Otis Rush. Then Bo Diddley. Then John Hammond. Then, uh, who else in the pot? Yeah, here's Stevie Ray Bond right there. Here's Willie Dixon back here. That's amazing. Jimmy McCracken. Uh, Is that top. guitar light? Because you're moving it around like it's really light. Nothing. It's Honduran mahogany. It's wow. probably seven and a half pounds. Anyway, all of my heroes are on this everybody muddy waters junior wells buddy guy everybody that's really well, cool 
I got it down here and the pickup gave out. Anyway, I, I went through all kinds of hell. I finally got it kind of fixed and, and then I, I decided that what I wanted to do was get as close to that old bridge that Danny had put on there as I could. And I figured out that the Tone Pro pigtail was the best shot. Because now I know about adjusting intonation enough that I can achieve the perfect thing. Sure. But I had to inlay a piece of very, very, very hard wood in here. So this is something called bar barbajalote, which is will basically stop a bullet. Where'd you get that from? It lives here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, my helper and I inlaid that, and I put in the Tone Pro, and I'm back to square one. And this thing is back to being Godzilla again. Right on, man. Even got Willie Nelson. I mean, it's got, you know, it's got everybody on there, man. It's, That's really it's cool. Paul Barrere, the little feet. Old George. Old George. That's a man. That's really cool, man. So you turned it. And whatever happened to your 64 Strat? Up in uh, America, it's in the, in the van at my drummer's house. The idea of being, if and when we do another gig, um, he'll drive that and the bass player and his stuff to the first gig, and I'll fly and meet him, pull all the crap to the shows, and then you know he'll drop me off at the airport, and I'll come back here. That's, cool, that's, man. that's the plan. Now we don't know if that's how it's going to go or not. But oh, nobody you know, knows anything, man. Going, and so that's what we're sticking with until something changes that. Um, tell me some of the favorite, I, I mean, you've played with so many, I don't even know if I can ask you this question. Who are some of the favorite folks you played with? I know you said Muddy. Uh, well, obviously Muddy. Uh, Duke Robillard, um, for sure. I think my favorite guitar player to play with is still Earl Cape from the Cape Brothers. Okay. Um, he and I have a, a thing, a telepathy, a radar, whatever you want to call it, that I don't have with other guitar players. I don't play well with other guitar players. I just, I never have. I can do it, and I, I like to do it, but it's, it's not, um, I don't, I don't, I don't do it that well, but I do it with Earl very well. And uh, when I ever got a chance to play with those guys, which was numerous, numerous times, um, you know, they were, they were, um, <clears throat> their drummer was LeVon. Uh, and the drummer that they've had since LeVon went to Canada to play with uh, the band, was LeVon's um, nephew, Terry Cable. And Terry looks just like LeVon and sings just like LeVon and plays drums just like LeVon. And so uh, it's real exciting to play with those guys and do that old band stuff and their stuff. I mean, they, they're the, they may be the best um, rock and roll band in America. The K Brothers, I don't, I don't even know them. That's embarrassing. C-A-T-E. Yeah, I'm going to check them out. The Kate Brothers. Yeah. What are you typically playing through amp-wise? Oh, I play through Category 5s. Um, out of I, Dallas, I think? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> As it turns out, um, Don Ritter is married to a lady that was a very good friend of my dad. Oh, that's unusual. Well, my dad was a, um, a writer and a poet, and in his later years taught a few poetry courses. And this lady uh, took some courses from him. He, uh, as he got older, he began to, to gather kind of a harem of 
lovely young ladies that <laughs> followed him around and sort of worshipped him. And, and uh, she was one of the, she was his favorite out of the whole bunch. Anyway, she was very smart, married a very wealthy oil man whose hobby was playing guitar and building these amplifiers. And um, at some point, a friend of mine said, you've got to try these amps out. Well, I was in Colorado and he was doing a festival there. And he said, you've got to try these amps. They're, we're donating them to the charity. And I, I said, well, what's special about them? He said, I don't know. They just sound really good, man. And anyway, the guy says he's a friend of your dad's. I said, what? That's weird. My dad? <laughs> Anyway, I tried the amp, and I went, man, this thing is just killer. So I got a hold of it. As it turns out, of course, I knew who Don was. Once I put it together in my head, oh, okay, yeah. So he said, look, man, I want to build you a rig. And uh, he said, what was the best rig you ever played through? And I told him, he said, okay, we'll start there. We ended up with a signature amp that's named after my dad. Oh, that is cool, man. What's it called? What's your, what was your dad's? Typhoon Joe. The typhoon Joe. Was he a typhoon? Well, when my dad was in uh, World War II, he, one of the places he was stationed was Guadalcanal. And there was a typhoon Joe that came through during that period. So it all made sense. You know, these things are all named after hurricanes because Don donates 10% of the price to hurricane victims. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really cool. It's a benevolent uh, uh, thing that he does. And uh, so anyway, I got a signature model with uh, Category 5, and that's pretty much all I use anymore. I, I tried going with the quilter uh, aviators. I was trying to endorse those, but I kept blowing them up. <laughs> Think about trying to play a fact attack through a, an eight inch speaker just didn't quite work <laughs> anyway um so what does your category five have 12s two by 12. yeah i have one that's got uh well the the signature amps have one twelve in each but there's different configurations you can you can of course get you can get the head with a different cab or whatever but the Sure. The amp is basically a, a 50 watt Marshall kind of man. So it's basically that. Let's see if you can see where I can. Yeah, you just, I don't know if you can see it. It's really, yeah, I can. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's designed over a um, JCM 800? CM 800. Yeah. It runs EL 34s and it's, you know, the thing about those uh, cats is that they have a, a voltage knob. Oh, that is cool. Some of the voltage goes through the power tubes so that the tone from the front end can be the same at 11 as it is at 1. Yeah, that is really cool, those attenuators, man. It's not an attenuator. It's or what, the, what do you call it, voltage? The voltage um, uh, control. Yeah. <clears throat> and it works very, very well. I don't use it. I just, I dime the damn thing, you know. T tell me, man, your uh, knee jerk reaction just for now. Top three Desert Island discs. Desert Island, one of them would be Radio Land by the Gate Brothers, I would have to say. <clears throat> Let's see, I think um, probably uh, Very Extremely Dangerous by Eddie Hinton and The Best in Muddy Waters. Yeah. Eddie was a big influence early on in my, my singing, when back when I could actually kind of sing. Getting together with him was a real learning experience. You know? <clears throat> I learned a lot from him. Um, tell me an interesting question. What are the most important lessons you've learned in life in general? 
in general. Yeah. Uh, don't be an asshole. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I'm working on that one. <laughs> I think that's something you always work on, right? It's kind of like it's kind of like recovery. It, it's yeah. It, I mean, you're still working on it the day they lower you down. Yeah, man. What's a good one? <laughs> and, and the other thing, of course, is it's the, the old cliche. Um, learn to uh, do something you love for your work because you'll never work a day in your life. Man, where did you get that? It is cliche, but where did, how did you sign off on that so early? I found myself doing what I wanted to do for a living by the time I was 18. And I said, here I am, I'm making a living doing exactly what I always wanted to do. I wanted to do this from the time I was about 12. Did, you said your dad was a, a creative. Did that help seeing that as an inspiration? Like, you know, hey. I don't think so, because his creativity was never on display in the house. Okay. Not something that... We had a very strained relationship until much, much later. Um, we did not get along. And uh, it wasn't until uh, he had uh, split from my mother and I had been a, uh, a full-grown man with an alcohol and drug problem for quite a while and had gone around the world and uh, seen many, many things that we were able to actually sort of sit down and bury whatever hatchet there was and um, realize that we were a lot more alike than we were different. That's good. And uh, one of the things that I would recommend that anyone does that's estranged from someone like a parent or a brother or a sister is make amends with that person before you die. Mm. I think it's very important to, because whatever it is, it's not nearly as important as you think, <clears throat> but it will be something that will torture you the rest of your life if you don't, if you don't reconcile it. And I guess that's something that's in the 12-step uh, uh, program as far as uh, people you've hurt. Uh, yeah, making amends, yeah. And I, didn't, uh, I didn't go through that. <laughs> I, was, I was the guy that said, oh, are you an alcoholic? No, I'm a drunk. Those alcoholics got to go to fucking meetings. <laughs> yeah, man. You wouldn't, and you weren't the first guy that said that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, to me, it's to me, it was uh, exchanging one addiction for another in many ways. But that's just that's just me. Yeah, you know, guy that says if it saved your life, I don't give a shit what you did. I don't care, don't care what it was. Yeah, psychology or uh, the twelve step program or uh, meditation or you know. <clears throat> Anything but joining a Kool-Aid drinking cult. Yeah, man. Uh, if it saves your life from the, the little guy on this side that we talked about. Yep. It, uh, it's worth it. Hell yeah. Uh, so you just mentioned your dad. What is the most important thing he taught you? Huh. Well... Hmm. He didn't teach me much. My dad was kind of a recluse, and um, he suffered from depression. Uh, depression. And he kind of just let the old lady bring us up, me and my brother. Um, I longed for his uh, camaraderie and, and um, friendship. But I never got it until much later. <clears throat> uh, a lot of my interaction with him was um, volatile. So there wasn't a lot of, of teaching moments. Um, but mostly my father would come in and tell me whatever I was doing, I was doing it all wrong. 
Yeah. So what, what did you learn not to do from him? Cause that's a, that's as important. You learn not to be around him. That's funny. Yeah. But I, that's as important as anything when you're a kid growing up around that man, that survival skill of knowing not to go there and get that negative shit. Mother was a very upbeat person and I was more or less that kind of person too. And so I learned pretty quickly that um, hanging around people like my dad was a downer. And so I tried to, I, I went into the music because it made me happy. Yeah. And played it, we're happier people for the most part. And so I, I gravitated towards that. And I accentuate the positive and forget the other stuff. So that was your refuge in a sense, man. Oh, it always has been. It That's awesome. Been. And um, it, it's, it, it has always been one of those things when, when things get really weird, that's where I go. I go and I pick one of those up. That's one of them things. Mm. I've got a bunch of them. And that ain't all. That's just the ones here. And that's not even all of them. A bunch more. I go for those, and all of a sudden, you know, things kind of, kind of even out. You kind of go somewhere else, you know. Yeah. Uh, you have hobbies outside of music and chickens. No, it's chickens. You know, some days it's feathers, some days it's chicken. <laughs> you uh, you you sell the chick. I'm assuming you sell the chicken to people for meat. No, no, no. We don't have a big flock. We have enough to um, keep us in fresh eggs. Okay. And they're a lot more pet chickens than they are. Gotcha. You know, <clears throat> it's one of those things if it gets really serious, we'll eat them. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Not there yet. Do you, uh, do they wake you up early? Yes. Oh, shit. Like what time? Wow, 5.30. Holy crap. Go to bed, you know. <laughs> I was lucky <laughs> if I had run out of coke. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, what's the favorite place you've traveled? You've been all over. Um, <clears throat> I, I adored Spain. I adored Spain, and I had, um, I had my mind blown on a regular basis, pretty much every day in Japan. Really? You know what? What did you like about it? Because I, I hear those two countries quite often, actually. Well, Japan was, uh, the, the most interesting thing was how they melded the, the ultra, ultra, ultra modern technology with the ultra, ultra old historical uh, architecture and culture the two things somehow managed to coexist without being diametric, even though they're diametrically opposed, they exist together in some sort of harmony. Um, I've never quite been able to figure out how that works, but. That's their culture. Japanese culture in general is all like based on things existing. To, like a, a lot of Asian countries tend to be more like, let's figure out how to just be chilled out about stuff. Yeah, and we so are. Japanese have a have a, an honorable thing about them. Uh, I, I'll never forget my wallet falling out of my pocket uh, as I was drunkenly getting out of a cab one morning, uh, two o'clock in the morning, and you know, I just went into the Japanese Ryokan, uh, that, you know, just a very traditional thing. And, Slept on my little tatami mat and got a hangover. Got in the bus the next morning. I went to the next city and then realized my wallet was missing. And of course, I had images of, you know, I got every credit card known to man in that thing. And I, I'm envisioning all these little Japanese guys in leather jackets running out of stores with big screen TVs. And you know, I'm going, holy shit, I'm in big trouble. Just, just calling the credit card companies from Japan. Is going to break me just to can. Yeah. Her uh, manager said, "No, nah, don't worry about it." You know, what do you mean, don't worry about it? He said, "Hey, we'll we'll call down there when we get to the next place." 
So we get there, he calls the chief of police of the city that we had just left. And he says, oh yeah, he wants to talk to you. I get on the phone, he says, ah, oh, Mr. Thackeray. He says, uh, you have a warrant? I said, yeah. He says, you have a American Express card? Yes, that's right. You have a Visa card? Yes, that's right. He said, uh, you have a yen? And I said, yes. He said, how much yen? I said, I don't know, I think it's about 60 bucks. He said, no, 85. 85. <laughs> you get wallet at next stop. And sure enough, when I got to the next place, my wallet was waiting at the desk. Wow. Well, thievery is just non-existent for the most part. That is magical, man. So you leave your you know, $1,000 Nikon on a bus. Uh, you go back to the lost and found. It's going to be there. That's so cool. You know, um, there's, there's very little crime. Um, it, it's amazing to me that that many people crammed into that small a space can function as well as they do and get along. I mean, remember, we turned that place into a big cinder. Yeah. In and somehow, by 1980, they had bought the United States. Yeah, man, it's a very... Uh... Yeah, I don't know how. I, I think the expectations there are just higher for themselves. Work ethic. Something yeah. Americans possess hardly at all anymore. There mm. are some. There, as a nation, they have a work ethic that is just unbreakable. Yeah, work ethic and, and expectations. Yeah, they expect things to be a certain way. You know, you, you just like when kids are born, you're expected to work hard in certain, you know, in, in education. Well, rotten until you're 13. Here, yeah, yeah, it's a little different. Then the the whip comes there. Yeah, well, I didn't raise my kids like that. I can tell you right now, <laughs> they were working and earning stuff. Because I I don't like I I agree. I think that's poison. And I think you ruin some of them when you do that to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Anyway, it was incredible. But Spain was just. I I thought that I might have been able to move there at one point. I liked it so much. I wouldn't do it now, but I was so enamored with it. Um, remember that, now this would have been about 1995, I guess, when I started going over there. And it hadn't been that long since they had gotten away from Franco. Mm, so, okay. country, they were ready to party. <laughs> yeah. They were extremely liberal. They were extremely uh, open-minded. Their culture was booming. Um, anything goes. They were friendly. They were like, yeah, man, welcome. And the crowds were incredible. You could do no wrong. You, you slept late. You know, you, you had your gig didn't start till one in the morning. You went wow. to dinner. You didn't go to dinner till 1030 because it's the Mediterranean, you know. So you go out for dinner around 10.30 and you'd eat this big, gigantic, lovely paella and all these beautiful vegetables, a pitcher full of sangria and all that. Then you'd go to the club and you'd play a set and by the time you were rolling up your chords, in the, in the door comes the vampire, the disco vampires. So it's, it's four o'clock in the morning and they're coming in the door dressed to the nines, the, the electronic dance music starts. These people party like crazy till 7 a.m. Then they go into the bathroom and change clothes and go to work. Holy crap. Then at, at noon, everything stops and everybody goes and goes, takes a nice long nap till about four in the afternoon. Wow, up, that's different. Go back to work for an hour or two. And then they go back home and relax and wait for dinner, 10.30. It's a very civilized country. You know? Wow, I had no, that's wild. Um, toughest decision you, you ever had to make or most difficult thing you had to do? Uh, stop drinking. Right on, great. man. Hard to do. And I mean, of course, it doesn't seem that way in the rearview mirror, but at the 
time. That's like one of the most daunting things you can face. Um, that was was very very hard. Um, and the other thing was leaving the leaving the Hawks was very for me because uh, you're stepping off into space. Uh, although in retrospect, of course, I was just stepping into another different situation that was more or less safe. It was going to a different band. Probably the uh, as far as uh, moving out of the country would probably be the, the most um, life altering thing because you just you know I mean not just it's not like you're moving to France. You're moving to a jungle in Central America. It was it was completely weird. Yeah. And, uh, it was a leap of faith, you know. And I was I would never have done it without my lovely wife, both of us agreeing to do it and saying, Hey, I will if you will. And we'll both jump off the roof together. And how long have you been with her? You guys been together how long? 20 years? Congratulations, man. That's awesome. That's very cool. Last question, man. Tell me the biggest change in you over the last 10 years. And has that change been intentional or has it just been a natural change through aging? My stress level. I've worked very, very hard to take my stress level down to <clears throat> as little as possible. Um, That's such an important thing, man. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, I, I've got a very good friend. He was in that very first blues band. And I love him to death. And we've been friends for 50 years. And we still talk regularly. We email every day and talk on the phone fairly often. Um, as a matter of fact, he shares my rhythm section. When I'm not out, he uses them to do local gigs if, they, if he can get them. Uh, that guy works his ass off. He's got his own construction company. And he has worked his ass off as long as I've known him, for 50 years. Uh, he's brought up uh, two kids. He's um, he's had two wives. His own construction company. He plays any time he can on the weekends, anywhere he can. You want to talk about a guy who burns the candles at, at both ends and stresses himself out over all of it. He still has an, an ability to maintain this um, sort of sense of humor about it all, you know. Uh, <clears throat> it's very, very, I worry about him a lot because as I take my stress level down and, you know, there's, there, there's less and less of the compelling event in my life. This guy's life is nothing but compelling events. Yeah. Every hour, every minute of every day of every year is, is his life revolves around a compelling event, multiple compelling events. And I have, I've executed mine one by one. And I'm now pretty at ease. I mean, it's now um, the hardest thing I got to do is feed these animals. You know? right. You know, it's and do that and water all these. Right now, we're in a real a bad dry spell that will go on till June, and so every day I got to get out there and water two acres. Holy shit, that's a lot. That's a lot of space, man. How do you how do you even how do you do that? You have like automatic sprinklers around the place? No, I didn't that's think. So. All a big hose. Holy yeah. crap! Yeah, we've got multiple hoses on. Well, different. Uh, we've got two different meters. I have the lot that the house was built on, which is an acre. And then at some point, my wife convinced me that we needed to buy the one next to us, which is another acre. Right. And we 
was the jungle and we planted. Oh, that's nice. Fruit trees and vegetables and put the chickens back there. And um, I also have a large aviary out back with four parrots and one wild parrot that lives on the top of the cage that's just started showing up. So I have five parrots. Now, I don't know if you've spent any time around parrots. No, I haven't, <laughs> to be honest. These things are the most noisy, obnoxious animals on God's earth. I love them dearly. But they do, at first light, they all begin to screech at the same time. It's oh, loud. It's absolute. I'm going to send you a re recording. <laughs> when I got here, I bought this place from a retired veterinarian from South Africa. And one by one, he began to collecting these parrots. These kids finally realized that he'd buy them for $5 if they could shoot them out of a nest. You know, oh it's God. actually illegal to own them without a permit now. Oh, interesting. Because there's a black market for them. The, the black market on exotic birds is, you know, the price is very high. So it's very much, you have to have them banded and licensed. <clears throat> anyway, when I got here, he said, he pointed out back and showed me this giant aviary right off the back porch. And he said, do you want to keep the birds? And I said, well, yeah, I guess. I had grown up with a parrot. My mother had one. Oh, okay. Hated my guts. She was the only person that could get near that fucking thing. And it was just an obnoxious animal. But I, I said, okay. Well, there were 10 of them in there. How did you get rid to send you a recording of what 10 parrots sound like first in the morning. How did you, uh, what happened to the other six? Well, there is a, a bird rescue place here. These are the people that kind of lobbied for everyone to have a permit, permitted bird. And what they try to do, allegedly, on paper, what they do, I think they're full of shit myself, but <laughs> what, what they tend to do anyway is confiscate animals that people are keeping in small cages and maybe abusing or that they've found that are in the wild that are injured or something like that. they put them in a big flight cage and they allegedly uh, rehabilitate them and teach them how to forage again and then release them into the back into the jungle and i think this wild one that's banded but is now living on the top of the cage I think he's one of the... Oh, he the, came from that. Yeah, okay. So uh, rather than send him back to that hell hole, I'm feeding him here. He's That's alive. cool. Do you have like... Yeah. I'm imagining you have cats show up all the time, no? Oh, there's a, there is a cat. I got four dogs. So oh. This way. Yeah. I've got a, two pit bulls and a, and a, uh, a big red dog. Yeah. And so the cats don't come over very often so i got the cats and the birds and the parrots the cats and the chickens and the parrots it keeps me busy yeah man gets me outside and i'm getting a lot of vitamin d from the sun right control viruses and all that kind of stuff you know that's kind of my my deal here man um it's a simple it's a simple life it's a much simpler life. Um, my wife said that um, back in Arkansas, she said, I spent pretty much the majority of every day fending off the gizmocracy, the cable bill, the bank, the taxes, this bill, the water bill the phone bill, all this junk, which was just eating everything, just like a big Batman, you know? And it was just constant frustration trying to get anything done with these people up there. It's just, it's like pulling your hair out. 
you know, I, I do want to ask you one more thing because I'd be from my own and anybody who's ever heard you play interest. You have such an authentic way. Let's stick to talking about blues guitar. Not that you're not authentic with anything else, but that's what I love about your playing the, when you're playing blues. You're so, um, there's something very natural. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you'll hear blues players and they're playing the blues, but it's, it's like, it's not from in, you know what I mean? You have such an innate ability to communicate musically. Where, where did that come from? Like besides practicing? First of all, I'm a melody guy. Um, the pentatonic scale is great, and it's what we use in this music. If we didn't have the pentatonic scale, if we didn't have Robert Johnson, you wouldn't have Lady Gaga. Okay, yeah. that's right on. It comes from blues. This is what, you know, as Towns Van, Dan Van Zandt once said, you got two kinds of music. You got blues and zippity doo -dah. You got to pick one. <laughs> anyway i'm a melody guy i like melody my philosophy is whatever you play make it make sense to somebody who's not a player so that they can whistle it the next day in the shower does that make sense yeah it does but to um to 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 do that so fluidly, like uh, I, I, I can't, I can't even articulate what I'm trying to s ask you, or I don't even know the right question to ask. Everything that you're playing, Jimmy, it's I know you're into melodies, but everything just works all the time. And there's not a lot. I mean, you know, if I think of blues players, you know, you look at Stevie Ray Vaughan did that. Um, Totally different style player. One of my favorites, Freddie King, did that. Um, but everything always works, man. It's like the best example of what I'm talking about. You can whistle Hideaway. You can whistle San Jose. You can yeah. walk down and you know what the stumble. Yeah. Is. What we've got now, we've got shred contests. That's what a lot of the newer guys. The younger guys and you know uh i was i was dear friends with tv and i loved him and he was a great influence what he and i used to say is we both came up the same way we were both you know we were like this it, learning from the same people and picking the same stuff out of it yeah oh well universe but in many ways i feel like Stevie's popularity, a lot of it is what what people took from that, what younger guys took from that, is the wrong stuff. That's interesting. I mean, they, they took, took the shred and they left the melody behind. Right. He was a very melodic guy. Listen to Lenny. I mean, that's yeah. just... Uh, yeah. So, you know, um, and I'm not saying some of the younger guys can't play that, but they can't play it and make you cry. Man, that's you know, what you do. You, yeah, man, that's what you do. You make, you know how to make it cry. Young, these young guitar geniuses. Well, okay, I'm real glad that we got those guys and that they're carrying along and all that. But you know, you got to quit worshiping these kids because, as much as and, and as much as I want to encourage them, what I see, you know. When we were that, that age or younger, we had to first go to the drugstore and steal the record. <laughs> oh, those skin in the game was night and day. And, and then we had to put it on a 16 RPM turntable and try to pick out what the hell Hubert Summer was playing. What the fuck is that? Yeah. Noise and how do I make it? Well, these kids got a DVD with a remote control and a big screen TV. They can go back and watch the list 
a thousand times until they get it right. Hmm. It's just the learning curve is just not that steep. So it, there's that that they've got going on, which is a negative in my mind. And the other thing is, those kids never got to watch Muddy Waters or Jimmy Cotton or Carrie Bell or Lurie Bell or J.B. Hutto or um, Helen Wolf or uh, Charles Brown or um, Nappy Brown or, or any of these people. These people could take this music. It was the simplest music of all. And they could take it and with the dynamics they could create this drama, which could, could scare the daylights out of you, for one thing. It could make you burst into tears. It could make you jump up on your feet and scream. It could do a variety of emotional reactions out of people. What we got now is a bunch of kids that want to be Joe Bonamato. Nothing against <laughs> Yeah, nothing against Joe, yeah. But you know, it, it, okay, that's one level of this stuff. But the deep shit, the really deep shit, has been overlooked. And there's a thousand Stevie Ray wannabes out there yeah. that, and, and none of them are ever going to elicit the same emotional response from anyone as that guy did. There was only one guy. It's like, it's, it's like watching Randy Hansen do Jimi Hendrix. It's <laughs> really thing, but it ain't the same thing. I'm yeah. sorry. It's no. as close as that, but it's not the same thing, and it's never going to be. Yeah. So I, I just think, you know, I think the fundamentals have been, um, this goes back to what we were talking about when we first started this interview. This goes back to, being able to be there in the moment, in person, in the audience, or on the bandstand, that interaction between performer and audience, that communication where everyone is suddenly feeling the same emotion that's being projected by that artist, a lot of that is missing now. Yeah, and because of the lack of playing and availability and, and venues and blah, blah, yeah. blah. And we can we can put a concert on Facey Page or Crawl Space or whatever you want to call it, but it's not going to be the same, man. It's just yeah. not. You know, we're not uh, we're not going to we're not going to reach that level of emotion of that of that whole catharsis that blues is all about. Blues was a catharsis. Absolutely, it still is for me, man. I love it, but. And, and this goes back to what do you do for your for hobbies? You know, where do you go? Yeah, I go in here and I put these things up and I have a catharsis from that. Um, and and I, I'm not saying these kids aren't dedicated any less or any more than anybody else ever was. I'm just saying there's a level of it that they were not able to experience. That and having your heart broken. 50 times in a row. Yeah, that happen that helps, man. Getting your ass kicked helps you play the blues. You know, a big difference. You know. The idea Lang when he was 14 years old singing about having his heart broken by so you know, I'm sorry, kid. <laughs> you play really good. You got a nice voice. You're not gonna you're not gonna well, man, let me uh, first thank you for all the great music you put out, man. You're just a beautiful player, man. I really, really appreciate, you know, everything you've done musically. It's just uh, to have your own thing the way you do, it's really special, man. And, and you've put out well, a lot of good vibes. So thank you. And I... Uh, old has-been feel pretty good today. No, man, you're not a has-been. And I forgot to thank J.P. Soares, I think, for connecting us. So, J.P., thank you very much. Also... Um, Everybody, I just want to tell you, if you aren't hip to Jimmy Thackeray, you really, and you're a guitar player, and if, especially if you're a blues player, man, you got to check out his music. You know, anything with Jimmy Thackeray and the Drivers, you know, we can go back as far as the Nighthawks, but man, this is a happening, really soulful cat, man. And uh, hopefully, 
Jimmy and I were talking before we started recording and he is going to be coming out with something when the apocalypse ends and uh, he'll come back on the show here and I'll uh, turn everybody on to it because I'm looking forward to hearing it. A any final words of wisdom, man? I wanted to say something about JP. Yeah. Because I get asked in these situations right here like we're doing right now, who do you think that you've heard lately has really got something special going on? My answer is usually nobody. And I don't mean to be arrogant or snotty or anything. You know what I like about you, man? You, you just fucking say it as it is. That is awesome. <laughs> you know, once you've heard Duke Robillard or Danny Gatton, if you played with Danny Gatton and played with Roy Buchanan some, and you've done things with Muddy Waters and Bob Margolin and, and some stuff with Johnny, and I mean, you know, you've seen all that stuff. And so all of these new cats that are coming up, who's the new cat, you know? You kind of go, ah, I don't know. I, I got to tell you. But one guy did do it to me. And I walked into a studio after a festival where they were doing a commemorative CD of all of the artists to help with the charity that we were playing for. And I walked in and JP was playing his big guitar with his chump hat on and singing like Howlin' Wolf and playing like T-Bone Walker or something. And I just stopped dead in my tracks and I went, okay, who the hell is this guy? And where has he been? Yeah. And we became buddies like that. And to me, he is one of the guys that is, he is taking this music, retaining its integrity, and still doing his own thing with it. Yes. And with it and knocking down new horizons with it. Well, he's one of the few people I think out there that's doing that. And he's got a great story. His personal story is really cool from where he came from to where he is now. It's very, it's the real deal. Yeah, for sure. Now that guy could play the blues. He could play the blues. He's earned it. Hey, listen, man. You should look up his death metal band. He told me about that, man. He was telling me about that. Really big in South Florida. Yeah, he was. <laughs> I mean, these guys were the. I mean, it was the real deal with the marshals and the hair tossing. And I mean, it, oh, my God. You can't believe it's the same guy. Yeah, I'm going to. I did not check that out. I, we talked about it. I'm going to look that up. Hey, hey, it's on YouTube. It's hilarious. Uh, Jimmy, let me wrap this up. Thank you very much for everything. I hope you come back. I'd love to see you. I'm happy that you're in Belize. I'm happy you're happy. And um, uh, I'd love to have you back on the show when your next uh, EP or record comes out. And congratulations on 20 years of uh, marriage and all the years of sobriety behind you, man. Thanks, man. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Big thanks to Jimmy Thackeray. If you don't know Jimmy's music, I would implore you to check it out. This is a guitar show, man. There comes no better blues player than Jimmy Thackeray. And uh, most important, especially nowadays, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody, and I'm out. Jimmy, thanks for everything, brother. You're bad, man. Thanks.